Hello, fellow teachers, and welcome to Teaching with Power. My goal is to help you teach the scriptures with more relevancy, impact, and power. As you're watching, if you like what you hear and see, I'd really love it if you subscribed, liked, and shared with other people. This week, we're going to be covering four books of scripture, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. It's a lot to cover, but, you know, they're all relatively short books. And thematically, I'm going to lump the Timothys and Titus together and then do Philemon on its own. But as usual, let me give you some background. Timothy was a former missionary companion to Paul and had accompanied him on his second missionary journey. So a very close friend. And Paul writes this letter to Timothy from prison in Rome. 1 Timothy was written during Paul's first imprisonment, but then he was released some time after. He left with Timothy and Titus on a teaching tour, but then later Paul was rearrested and imprisoned once again. And Paul writes 2 Timothy from Rome as well, and it's apparent that at that point Paul is feeling that his death is, uh, is imminent. At that time, Timothy is a church leader in the city of Ephesus. Paul's put him in charge there. Timothy's father was a Greek Gentile, but he had a Jewish mother and a Jewish grandmother, Lois and Eunice. And we also know one more interesting detail about Timothy. He's young. How young? We don't know. And then what about Titus? Titus was a Gentile that was converted by Paul himself. And on that teaching tour between imprisonments, Paul traveled to Crete with Titus and placed him in charge of the church there to call some local leaders and to establish the church. So we can look at both the Timothys and Titus as Paul's counsel to some local church leaders. For an icebreaker, I want you to imagine that I have a big cup of very highly toxic poison in a glass. And if I were really standing in front of you, I'd fill that glass with water, put a skull and crossbones symbol on it, and maybe even add some red food coloring to uh, heighten the effect. Then I'd ask you to imagine that it was filled with a toxic and perilous, and that's the word that I would use, a perilous poison. How toxic is it? If you were to swallow it, it would cause paralysis and death within minutes. If it were to get onto your skin, it would cause permanent damage and burn. In fact, it's so toxic that if you even breathe in the fumes, it causes lung damage. Now, if that were the case, how would you handle it? And I imagine that most of you would answer with things like, uh, well, I wouldn't handle it at all. I'd, I'd want to stay as far away from it as possible. And if I absolutely had to handle it, I'd protect myself. And at that point, I'd bring out a pair of gloves, some safety goggles, maybe a respirator mask, or if I had one, a hazmat suit. And, and in that scenario, you would do anything in your power to keep yourself safe. Now, I want you to consider this question. Do you treat the things the prophets tell us are dangerous in the same way? Why or why not? The prophets have warned us of many things that are dangerous. Things like hatred, pride, drugs and alcohol, disobedience, spiritually damaging music and movies, and the modesty. Do you react the same way to them? Do you strive to protect your spirit in the same way that you would your body from poison? Paul is going to use a very interesting word to describe the latter days in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. Go in and see if you can find it. The answer is perilous. Perilous times shall come. He wants us to understand that the latter days are going to be very dangerous or perilous times. And then Paul is going to give us a huge list of what makes our day and age so dangerous. And without looking yet, what do you think he's going to say? Is he going to say terrorism, health epidemics, war, Hurricanes, economic hardships, political turmoil, high cancer rates, global warming? Is that what makes our world so dangerous in the latter days? Well, let's find out what he says. Now I want you to read verses 2 through 5. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy without natural affection, and that means sexual immorality, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, which means without self-control, fierce, despisers of those that are good, 
traitors. And in that sense, it means uh, rebelliousness. Heady, which is rash or reckless. High-minded, which means to be conceited. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. So what makes the last days so perilous? Not medical epidemics, but moral epidemics. Not politics, but pride. Not disasters, but dishonesty and disobedience. Not global warming, but global wickedness. Not natural disasters, but spiritual disasters. We should be much more worried about the spiritual calamities of the latter days and not the physical ones. I mean, here's one way to look at it. If I die in a terrorist attack or a plane crash or a hurricane, I just die. Uh, I get my transfer to the spirit world a little earlier than I probably would prefer. But if one of these spiritual disasters gets me and I die spiritually, I lose my faith or my commitment to righteous living, well, that could affect me for eternity. It's a much bigger deal. Paul counsels us to turn away from such things. Remember that 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus are written to church leaders who are striving to lead their flocks to righteous action and faith. There are two major themes that I see in these books. The things that will help people to endure the perilous times and the things that will hinder or hurt people in these perilous times. And let's begin with the things that will not help us, the things that will hinder our spiritual progress and our faith. I'm going to give you the verses and you pull out the words and phrases that answer that question, and I'll stick them up on the screen. What kinds of things will not help us through our perilous times? I'm going to let you read the verses, but I'm going to pull out the words for you. Chapter 1, verse 4, fables. And now when we hear fables, we think of cute little stories with talking animals, but that's not what Paul means here. Here it means an account or story that's based on the falsification of facts. Endless genealogies. And what does he mean by that? Well, the Jews felt they were the chosen ones, and they felt the need to prove it through their family trees. It gave them a false sense of security that they were saved or better than other people just because of who their ancestors were. It would be like somebody in the church today feeling that they had a, a spiritual leg up on others, just because their great-great-grandfather happened to be a pioneer. And then one more thing in that verse, things which minister questions or cause us to question things. Chapter 1, verse 6, this is such a good one. He says, watch out for vain janglings, because those vain janglings have caused some of the members to swerve or to turn aside from their faith. We're going to jump all the way to chapter 4, verse 1. And there he talks about seducing spirits and the doctrines of devils. And these things cause many people to depart from the faith. I find the word seducing interesting. One meaning of the word seduce is to entice somebody into sexual activity. There are things out there that will seduce us away from the faith. Chapter 4, verse 7, profane and old wives' fables. Synonyms for the word profane include irreverent, obscene, sacrilegious, vulgar, and offensive. Chapter 6, verse 4. He talks about the proud that know nothing and dote about questions and strifes of words. And these things cause envy and strife, railings and evil surmisings. The footnote for that says wicked suspicions, right? thinking that everybody has an ulterior motive and that nobody has good intentions. And then chapter 6, verse 5, the perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, people that are destitute of truth. Now let's go to 2 Timothy, where the theme continues. Chapter 2, verse 4, he talks about people entangling themselves with the affairs of this life. That means getting all wrapped up in worldly concerns and desires. Chapter 2, verse 14, striving about words to no profit, having the effect of uh, subverting hearers. Chapter 2, verse 16, this is a fun one, profane and vain babblings. And what do those things do? They increase to more ungodliness. Chapter 2, verse 18, they've erred concerning the truth and they overthrow faith. Chapter 2, verse 23, 
foolish and unlearned questions, things that gender strifes. Chapter 3, verse 7, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Chapter 4, verse 3, lusts, heaping to themselves teachers, having itching ears. I think that last phrase means that they turn to sources or teachers that tell them what they want to hear. I have this itch in my ear, and I'm going to go to someone who's going to scratch that itch just the way I want them to. Chapter 4, verse 4, we have that word again, turning unto fables. And then now Titus, same idea. Chapter 1, verse 9, Titus talks about gainsayers. A gainsayer is somebody that opposes, is, is always seeking to contradict you. Chapter 1, verse 10, unruly, vain talkers, and deceivers. Chapter 1, verse 14, we've got fables again. And then the commandments of men that turn us from the truth. I can think of some other terms for the commandments of men. Uh, the rules of society, trends, fads, and popular opinions. And then finally, chapter 3, verse 9, foolish questions, genealogies, contentions, strivings about the law that are unprofitable and vain. All right, well, we've got a pretty good list here of the kinds of things that are not going to help us in these perilous times we live in. Now, take a good look at that list. I don't know if you're going to have the same epiphany that I did, but does that look like a description of anything in our world today? Where is it that we find vain janglings and babblings, the profane or obscene things that gender strife? Where can we find seducing spirits and the perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, foolish things, things that entangle us in the affairs of this life and the popular opinions of the day, things that also overthrow faith and just minister questions? Are you having the same impression that I am? It's the internet, isn't it? It's, it's social media, television, movies, things like uh, Reddit and Instagram and Facebook and fake news, all the anti-faith, anti-family, anti-virtue material that's out there. They're filled with things that incite anger and contention and gainsaying and questioning. The internet is pregnant with foolish, seductive, deceiving things. And isn't it fascinating that one of the most accurate descriptions of our modern technological age was written almost 2,000 years ago? He just nails it, doesn't he? If you wish to survive the perilous poisons of the latter days, it is essential that you minimize your exposure to the vain janglings, babblings, and seducing spirits of our age. And access to much of that kind of material is right in the palms of our hands. It's in our briefcases and on our desktops. The screens of Sodom are all around us. Now, I'm not going to say that everything on the internet and social media and television is all bad. I mean, for heaven's sakes, the video you're watching right now is on the internet. But I'm willing to bet you that 90% of what we find in those places fits Paul's description. Now, I want you to ask yourself this. How much time do I spend in that world? How much time am I exposed to this sort of contamination? Am I being slowly poisoned? Instead of being poisoned, what should you do with those things? Well, you tell me. Look at the following verses for your answer. In 1 Timothy 6, 5, withdraw thyself. 2 Timothy 2, 23, avoid. And in 2 Timothy 3, 5, turn away. All right, now for the other side of the equation. If I need to withdraw and avoid and turn away from such things, what am I going to turn to? Are there any spiritual safety goggles and gloves for me? Well, here's Paul's advice to an internet and social media hungry world. See if you can find the words and phrases that describe what will help us to endure the perilous times, where we can turn to for help. So 1 Timothy 1.3. He tells us to turn to no other doctrine. Chapter 1, verse 4, godly edifying, which is in faith. We should look to things that produce godly edifying, which is in faith. Chapter 1, verse 5, we should look for things that will produce charity out of a pure heart, places and things that we can go to in good conscience, with faith unfeigned or unpretended faith. And then we go to chapter 1, verse 10. And, and this is my favorite phrase in the whole lesson. Where are we going to go 
to stay grounded. Sound doctrine. We need to fill our lives with sound doctrine. Synonyms for the word sound? Solid, well-founded, reasonable, dependable, and firm. Chapter 4, verse 6, he tells us that we should be nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine. Chapter 4, verse 12, he tells us to be an example of the believers in word, conversation, charity, spirit, faith, and purity. We need to be a force for good in the world, to stand as a witness at all times and in all things and in all places. Chapter 4, verse 13, we need to give attendance to reading, to exhortation and doctrine. And chapter 6, verse 3, we should turn to wholesome words, the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the doctrine which is according to godliness. Now to 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verse 13, hold fast the form of sound words, which you've heard of me. And that means the prophets. So, did you listen to General Conference? Sometimes my students complain about the length of General Conference. And to that I say, well, so you'll sit and binge watch an entire season of a Netflix show, but you can't give the prophets of God a few hours on one weekend twice a year? You'll play a video game for two hours straight, but you can't sit through a single session? Which source are you turning to? Chapter 1, verse 14. Keep that good thing which was committed unto you by the Holy Ghost. Well, there's another source that we can turn to, the Spirit. Are you sensitive to its promptings? Do you listen for the still, small voice? Chapter 3, verse 10. Thou hast fully known the doctrine. Now, I want to end on chapter 3, verses 14 through 17, so we'll come back. But jump to chapter 4, verse 2. We should exhort with long suffering and doctrine. Chapter 4, verse 3, he says they won't endure sound doctrine. And then in Titus, chapter 1, verse 9, sound doctrine. Chapter 1, verse 13, sound in the faith. Chapter 2, verse 1, again, sound doctrine. Chapter 2, verse 7, doctrine. Chapter 2, verse 8, sound speech. And chapter 2, verse 10, adorn the doctrine. I don't know if you noticed it, but I think I see a bit of a theme. And now let's go back to chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. To me, this is one of the greatest sources that we can turn to for help in our perilous times. And it just so happens that these verses occur in the same chapter as that list of perilous poisons. That's the problem. Here's the solution. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned it, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, there's our word again, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished, unto all good works. So what's the source? It's the scriptures. They will make you wise unto salvation through faith. They're given through inspiration. And look at all the good things that they do for us. They're profitable. Great word. We profit from them. Doctrine, reproof, correction, righteous instruction, so that, that we can become more perfect and be full of good works. Oh, I love these verses. The scriptures are one of the greatest cures for the poisons of the world. I don't think I have to convince you of how much I love the scriptures. I know that whenever I feel overwhelmed by the world, when I feel lost or anxious or discouraged, if I turn to the scriptures, they always lift me out of it. Now, I've been teaching them for almost 20 years now. And even though they're ancient, they've never gotten old to me. So with this, can you see a better source for help in the perilous times? It's the scriptures, it's the prophets, it's the Holy Ghost. These are the places that we can go to for sound, firm doctrine and truth. So let's take a moment for some self-retrospection. Think about this past week. How much time did you spend here? And then, how much time did you spend here? And then I'd like you to consider these two personal questions. 
do you need to make an adjustment? And then, will you make an adjustment? If you want to endure the perilous times, turn to the right sources. Spend a majority of your time with the right sources. The words of the prophets, the promptings of the Spirit, and of course, the Scriptures. If you stick to sound doctrine over the vain and profane babblings of our age, I believe that you will one day be able to say what Paul said near the end of his life in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. So fight that good fight, and it is a fight. Life is a battle. And I promise you that if you will keep the faith, just like Paul, a crown of righteousness is waiting for you as well. Now maybe something a bit different here. Some of you have probably run into some parts of the epistles that are a bit troubling to you. And especially if you're a teacher, you might feel a little anxiety over what you might say if somebody asks you about some of those verses, particularly some of the ones that deal with uh, women's issues, um, same gender attraction or slavery. For example, what do you do with something like 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 through 15? Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, and then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing, if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. Whoa, uh, what are you going to do with that? Uh, I can see some people struggling with that. How on earth do we explain it? And there are other passages in Paul's writings that are like that. A little baffling. Well, here are a few things that you might want to consider when you encounter this sort of thing. Number one, it may not be translated correctly. Simply put, it might just be a mistake. The eighth article of faith tells us that we believe the Bible to be the Word of God as far as it is translated correctly. Perhaps the passages we're reading are mistranslations. They may not be correct. Number two, there may be an alternate translation of certain words. Uh, perhaps the words chosen by the King James Version translators are not the best or most accurate translations of those words. The meaning of words change over time. There are other possible translations that can be derived by the original Greek manuscripts that we have. And you can find these right in the footnotes. Instead of silence, look at the footnote for 12c. We could substitute silence with quietness. Or tranquility. Perhaps he's just saying that they should be reverent. Usurp authority could also be translated as exercise dominion, be autocratic or domineer. So perhaps he just means that women shouldn't try to usurp the role of presiding priesthood holders or to get into a power struggle. Well, that kind of puts that passage in a bit of a different light. It can help. However, you, you may still struggle with that, and that's okay. So maybe three Perhaps we're just misinterpreting the intent of the writer. I mean, we don't have Paul here to explain exactly what he means. There may be some key contextual factors that we just don't have. It says that they shouldn't teach. Well, I don't know about that one, but uh, women in Paul's day were certainly teaching the gospel and playing a pivotal role in the early church. He's constantly praising them by name and mentioning the good things that they're doing. Women like Tabitha, Rhoda, Lydia, Priscilla, Phoebe, Mary, Persis, Claudia. Women were definitely major players in the early church. And then in the books of Timothy themselves, just take a quick look at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, where he says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. And then in 2 Timothy 3.15, we know that Timothy had been taught from the scriptures from a child. Well, who was doing that teaching? Where did Timothy get the foundation of his faith and a love for the scriptures? Well, his grandmother and his mother. So you Loises and Eunices out there, teach your Timothys. 
God needs faithful women to teach the gospel just as much as he needs faithful men. And then also look in Titus chapter 2, verses 3 through 4, where Paul is giving advice to aged women. Look at what he says. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. Well, there you go. Here's Paul counseling the women to teach. So obviously, we have to consider what we read in 1 Timothy in light of everything that Paul said about the subject, not just one particular instance. And you know, the antis love to do this kind of thing. They like to dig up one single statement said by a church leader or a prophet and condemn the whole church or gospel by it. If we really want to know what a prophet thought about something, we should consider everything that he said about it. If we really want to know what the church believes about a certain thing, then we need to consider all the statements on it, not just one single instance. And what about those lines about Adam and Eve? You could interpret verse 13 as saying that Adam had authority or superiority over Eve. I don't see it that way. I see it as a description of the order of creation and that Adam had a responsibility for Eve. You could interpret verse 14 as a condemnation of Eve. I don't see it that way. I think all that verse 14 means is that they took the fruit for different reasons. Eve herself says that she was beguiled. Well, there's no condemnation there. We've all been deceived by the adversary in our lives. We've all partaken forbidden fruit at times. She was just explaining what happened. And then Adam partook of the fruit to stay with Eve and to fulfill the Lord's commandment to stay together. And then verse 15 has a key Joseph Smith translation change. It should read, notwithstanding, they shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. Having and raising children can be a saving act for faithful husbands and wives. I honestly don't believe that Paul felt that women were to be silent and listen to the men as a punishment for what Eve did in the Garden of Eden. That, that just doesn't coincide with all we know about that situation. Uh, think about the second article of faith. We believe that men shall be punished for their own sins and not for Adam's transgression. I think we could also say, we believe that women shall be punished for their own sins and not for Eve's transgression. I don't even think that Eve was punished for her transgression. I think what followed her decision was the natural consequences of mortality. Things that God intended all along for all of us. Work, childbearing, sorrow, good and evil, opposition. That was mortality, not a punishment. And if you want to learn more about that, just check out the first half of Moses chapter 5. Now, I'm not saying that my interpretation is the correct interpretation, but it's a possibility. There are different ways of understanding certain verses in the scriptures. Also, number four, we follow a living prophet. We don't need to get too concerned about things like this in the scriptures because we have living prophets that teach us the proper application of gospel principles in our day. Do the living prophets teach that application today? No. Women teach. They speak. They pray. They lead. They serve missions. They make decisions in the church. So don't let these Bible verses bother you too much. If the living prophet isn't applying it in that way, then we don't need to either. And then finally, one other possible thing to keep in mind. Let's not judge their age and culture by our age and culture. It's just not fair. It's impossible to not be affected and influenced in some ways by the culture that surrounds you. We have to appreciate and consider the world that Paul was teaching in. The church needed to grow, and he just can't take on every incorrect aspect of the Greek and Roman worlds all at once. You have to pick your battles. I mean, he's facing opposition from lots of places. Uh, the Greeks, they think that the idea of resurrection is silly. And the Jewish Christians who just can't let the circumcision thing go. And remember that most of the epistles that we've studied so far are filled with Paul dealing with problems. He's got a lot of things on his plate. He can't afford to also take on the patriarchal society and the institution of slavery as well. If he had, it's highly doubtful that the church would have even gotten to where it did get. God does need to be pragmatic with the way that he guides his church. Cultures are different, and church policies have to change and adapt over time, depending on the world around it. 
Now, don't get me wrong. I don't think that the Lord compromises on doctrine and fundamental principles. But policies, it's a little different. Just look at what's happening in the church today. President Nelson is changing a lot of policies to adapt to the world that we live in now. And on top of all of that, I think that we have to assume that Paul is also the product of his own time. We can't expect perfection from them according to our standards. This can apply to other ages too. We may look at some of the things that Joseph Smith and Brigham Young said and did in their day and be really bothered by it. But is it fair to expect them to be immune to the influence of their own age? I mean, we wouldn't want them to judge us by their age, would we? What if one of them came to our day and saw the way that our women dress compared to how they dressed? If a pioneer woman came and saw some of the Relief Society sisters wearing shorts or yoga pants, they'd be shocked. If they went to the beach and saw a member woman wearing what we would consider a very modest one-piece bathing suit, I think that they'd be horrified. Well, let's not be guilty of doing the same kind of thing to them. Let's not assume that everything about our culture and age is right and everything about theirs is wrong. I think that if we can keep these ideas in mind, we'll be able to understand or look past some of the few but more troubling passages in Paul's writings, and perhaps even in the scriptures in general and church history as well. I encourage us all to uh, keep an open and understanding mind. Well, let's move on to the shortest of all the books in the New Testament, the book of Philemon. Even though it's short, it really has some powerful messages. Sometimes I find that it's a good idea to allow my students to learn the book of scriptures on their own before we talk about it. And since Philemon is such a short book, I feel that this is a good place to do that kind of an activity. So I've put together a guided study worksheet that you or your students can work on either on your own or with a partner. And I'll make this available for download, but here's what it looks like. All of the answers can be found in the book of Philemon itself or in the Bible dictionary under the heading Pauline Epistles and then the subheading Epistle to Philemon and it's on page 746 at the back of your church edition of the Bible. So if you want to pause and try to do that activity, I think that you'll enjoy that. And now I'll lead you through the answers. Number one. Who was Onesimus? And the answer is B, a former slave belonging to Philemon who had robbed him and run away. Number two, what had happened to Onesimus while away from Philemon's household? The answer is A, he had met Paul and had been converted to the gospel. Number three, what counsel did Paul give to Onesimus? The answer, D, to return to his master and ask for forgiveness. Number four, what counsel did Paul give to Philemon and mark all that apply? The answer, all four are found in there. To acknowledge that all good things come from Christ in verse six, to receive Onesimus back as not only a servant, but a brother in verse 16, to receive Onesimus as if he were Paul himself in verse 17, and then to prepare a room for him in case he got out of prison and could visit, in verse 22. So all four are a correct answer. And then question number five, find all the words suggesting brotherhood in the verses below, and then fill in the blanks. So verse one, Timothy our brother, Philemon our dearly beloved, and fellow laborer. From verse two, Archippus, our fellow soldier. Verse 7, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. Verse 10, I beseech thee for my son, Onesimus. Verse 16, not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved. Verse 17, if thou count me therefore a partner. Verse 20, yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Verse 23, there salute the Epaphras, my fellow prisoner. And then Lucas, my fellow laborers, in verse 24. And now some short answer questions. Number six, how do you interpret verses eight through nine? And I really like these verses. They say, wherefore, 
though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient. Yet for love's sake, I rather beseech thee, being such an one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Now they might struggle with that, but here's what I think he's saying. He's saying, I could ask you as an apostle of God, I could be bold in Christ to use my authority to tell you what to do. He's kind of saying, you know what? I'm not going to pull the apostle card here on you. Yet for love's sake, I'm just going to ask you, not as an apostle, but Paul the old man, a friend of yours, will you do this for me, your friend? It's kind of a cool lesson in leadership, I think. He's not going to ask by authority, but he's going to try to lead by persuasion. Question number seven, what was Paul willing to do for Onesimus according to verses 18 through 19? He says, if he hath wronged thee or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it. Albeit I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me even thine own self besides. So he's basically saying, whatever Onesimus owes you, put that on my account. I'll pay for it. So here's Paul making a great self-sacrifice for a fellow brother. And then last question, what message does the book of Philemon teach you? Now, that's a completely open-ended question, of course, and I believe that there are numerable lessons that you can get from this little book. It teaches us something about forgiveness, fellowship and brotherhood, conversion, sacrifice to do the right thing, honesty, giving up personal gain to help somebody else, and many, many lessons that you can draw from it. But for me, the giant lesson of this tiny book is in the title itself. This is a different letter than all the others. How is it different? It's written to a single member of the church. It's not written to an entire congregation or even a church leader like all of the others are. It's just a straightforward letter written to one member of the church on behalf of another. It's an example of a simple act of kindness in behalf of a single lost soul. It shows us that apostles could be personal, not just concerned about cities and churches and leaders. We worship a one-by-one one God. God cares about individuals, and his apostles and prophets care about individuals. Even amidst all the responsibilities and administrative duties a leader of the church has, it all comes down to the one. The church was created to save individual souls. It's a means to an end, not the end itself. And there have been numerous stories told in General Conference where you see the brethren interacting with and blessing individuals. I believe I've told this story once before, but I've had personal experience with this principle. When my mother was dying of cancer, President Nelson, who, who wasn't the president of the church at the time, but an apostle, made the effort in his busy schedule to visit our home and to give my mother a blessing. Now, he, he didn't have to do that. And it's not possible for them to attend to every personalized situation in the church. But in as much as they can, I believe they all find time to interact with members on an individual basis. Now, he didn't use his priesthood power to heal her, but he gave my mother a beautiful blessing and promised her great joy in the future. And after the blessing, he took my mom's hands in his and looked into her eyes, and they, and all of us, shed tears together. It was a personal testament to me of the prophets and God's love for the individual. To me, that's the message of the book of Philemon. God knows you, God loves you, and you are of infinite worth as an individual in Christ's church. That is it for this week. If you would like a printable lesson plan with the ideas presented here, it's available at this website. And if you're interested in using the PowerPoint slides that were used to make this video, or if you'd like the Philemon study questions, they're available for a small purchase here. Both links are available in the video description below. I hope you enjoyed this lesson. If you did, please share it with others that you feel it could help. Thank you for watching, and as always, get out there and teach with power.